Oh my god. Oh no, 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 no! Hello, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Hardcore Mode. Part 5. The only series on YouTube where deaths are permanent. Science feels impossible to obtain. All my rockets explode, and everything generally sucks. Last time we changed out the crew on board the space station, then moved our space station into orbit around Mimis, and built an outpost on Mimis, including a space taxi. This time, we're going to scout out the other planets in the Kerbal system, collect science, attempt to build out a moon colony, and launch a new mission that intends to visit every single moon in the Jewel system. So, commence. Since the last episode, our top scientists have noticed some glaring issues with our fledgling space program. They pointed out how terrible our space installations truly are. The Void Space Center, to be quite honest with you, sucks. Our habitation modules provide very little time and space, our agricultural modules do not produce enough food to keep the Kerbal Knots alive, and the worst sin of all, it's kind of ugly. Ugh. Now on to the space outpost. This thing is even worse than the station. It's ugly, glitchy, doesn't provide any food, doesn't produce any science, and it has been overtaken by the Space Kraken. While trying to maneuver staff to take nice thumbnails for the last episode, two Kerbals had unfortunately passed away. One by phasing through the ground and then suddenly exploding. The other by standing on top of the ship and our reckless time warping caused a normally very survivable fall to become lethal. Therefore, two more flags were erected to memorialize the fallen. And a new mission was undertaken to create a more stable base on the moon. We are going to try to create the Mint Colony. A new place amongst the stars to collect data and then process that data to generate tons of science. New innovations have given us access to the Duna suite of parts. Up until now, we've been relying on a set amount of habitation time, which has been long, but ultimately limited, set to maybe two years at the most. Our new parts not only provide habitation time, but also set back the clock to allow our Kerbals to stay in space for potentially decades at a time. The Duna Suite also has access to more advanced agricultural modules that will hopefully generate enough food for our Kerbals to last that long as well. All that will be required is delivery of fertilizer to keep our crops growing, hopefully. Preliminary testing of the Mint Colony shows that as time passes, four Kerbals on board do not end up losing habitation time, but it actually increases. The colony is complete and looks like this when all set up except on Mimis. It consists of four habitation modules. One agricultural module, extra food on board in case of emergencies, science experiments, a mobile processing lab, a communication and electrical module, and two rocket engines meant for a smooth descent onto the surface of many moons. But how the hell are you going to launch this behemoth off the ground? That is where this launch vehicle comes into play. According to my calculations, this rocket has enough delta V to take us all the way into orbit around minutes. And then, if all goes well, we will be able to come in for a landing using the engines attached to the mothership. Four of the bravest Kerbals Kerbin has to offer climb aboard and is placed on the launch ready to be lifted off into orbit. The most aerodynamic craft created so far in Kerbal Space Program Hardcore. As the moon colony came in for a landing, I noticed something rather alarming. Nani? We had no fuel. We were indeed in a bit of a pickle. The surface came closer and I tried to think of something, anything I could do to save the ship, but it was not to be. The unthinkable happened. This was, needless to say, devastating. But why did this happen? Well, first of all, we did not bring enough fuel. Fair enough. But there was something else at play. When coming out of orbit, I noticed something horrible. Look closely. Do you see anything strange? The colony ship is missing a decoupler right here. Normally in KSP, if you have a decoupler between parts, there is no fuel transfer, and you cannot use the upper stage's fuel reserves by accident. By not adding this tiny part, I assume that the Delta V reserves were just bugged out, and the game couldn't calculate what we had left. Little did I know, the game was indeed functioning properly. I just had no fuel left to land. This one tiny mistake caused the entire mission to fail catastrophically. Four Kerbals perished in the greatest disaster to ever occur in the Void Space Program's history. In the worst part, there was no one to blame, but those damn engineers back at the VSP, how could they have possibly forgotten to add a decoupler? They went too far this time, and it was time for them to face some 
Radical Accountability. A quick ship was launched, got into orbit, and collected all of our crew currently aboard the VSC and returned them back home, safe and sound. There was no crew resupply this time. The Void Space Station's time was up. This thing had annoyed me for long enough. It served its purpose, and it's time to deorbit this one until a new one can be structed that allows for longer habitation times. A new operation was undertaken at the VSP, the Curge. All vestiges of the old order were eliminated. Ships were dismantled. Those who were willing to step down from their posts were allowed to leave gracefully, and those who resisted were subsequently retired. The entire Void Space Center was restructured and a new era was upon us. The era of innovation. Out of over 100 applicants, 12 of my best and brightest YouTube subscribers were screened and then subsequently hired, tasked to lead the next generation of Kerbals into heights previously thought impossible. Wish them well in their future endeavors, and with any luck, they will survive for a little longer than the previous crews. The first priority of the new administration was scouting out more planets. We knew surprisingly little about all the other bodies. Our previous mission to scout out Duna had failed due to me attaching the wrong antenna. These missions take a long time to go interplanetary, but with all of our Kerbals back home, we now have years to spend waiting on orbital transfer windows. The need for planetary exploration started a brand new program, the Pillager Program. Much like the Viking invasions of medieval Europe, our probes will raid the nearby planets for science and send all that back home. The Pillager was a huge improvement over previous probe designs. Equipped with new solar panels, all the new science experiments, and the second most overpowered part in Kerbal Space Program, the nuclear engine. If a normal chemical rocket is a hammer, then a nuclear engine is more like a chisel. A normal rocket engine is rather inefficient. While it does vary quite a bit, an ISP of 310 to 350 is about what you would expect. They also require rocket fuel and oxidizer to function. On the other hand, a nuclear engine gets an ISP of 800 and only uses liquid fuel, cutting out the need to carry heavy oxidizer into orbit. That's an improvement in efficiency of over two times, allowing us to go farther than ever before. There is one downside though. They do have low thrust, but this can be overcome by just adding more. Excellent, now that we have a craft, what are our destinations? The first pillager is launched with the target of Moho. It's seldom explored in KSP due to how unbelievably face-meltingly hot it is. We are only sending a probe and not a Kerbal, so it should be fine. Once our craft gets into orbit, it sheds its shell, and it's time to fire up those new nuclear engines and send our craft to the closest planet to the sun in this game. Unfortunately, our craft is flying by Moho at 6,000 meters per second, and there's no hope of slowing down. All that can be done is burn to where we can skim the surface to collect that science in high and in low orbit, and simply enjoy the view. Both were indeed done successfully, and for the first time in KSP Hardcore, we have collected science from another planet. Exciting. After exiting Moho's Spear of Influence, a course was set for Jewel because that's the only thing that we can do with the extra fuel we have on board. Now, on to the Pillager Mark III. Its destination is Jewel and was loaded up with even more fuel than the previous mission because its goal is an ambitious one that, if accomplished, will pay huge dividends. We are going to attempt to visit every single Julian moon in just one mission. But what happened to the Villager Mark II? Its target is E, but the transfer window calculator kind of did me dirty, so we'll have to wait on that one. Much like the Pillager 1, it is launched in a dual transfer window, and it's set to reach its destination in four years. Luckily for us, I can just time accelerate until we make it into Jewel Spear of Influence. Upon arrival, the craft burns to come into contact with Tylo because we can use its gravity well to slow down and save on some fuel, as well as collect some science nearby. Tylo is kind of big, but also boring. It looks like the Mun, but larger. Our next stop was Pole. It's the smallest moon Jewel has to offer and it's also the second lowest gravity of any body in KSP, besides Gilly of course. It is a very hilly mountainous terrain and it is a strange color too. Nonetheless, science needs to be harvested. The third visit from the Jewel system was Bob. 
Similar to Pole, it's very mountainous, with some of them reaching a height of 22 kilometers above the surface. A high orbit is required when visiting. Other than that, it's brown and rather uninteresting, but it will make an excellent addition to our data collection. We then move on to Val. More interesting than the other three, Val is tidally locked jewel, meaning it doesn't rotate for day and night cycles. Our testing indicates that Val's surface is covered in ice and may contain liquid water, but more testing will be required to confirm that fact. It is also very interesting to look at and adding to our science collection. After leaving Val is the most interesting moon Jewel has to offer. This one is called Lade, and it bears a striking resemblance to the planet that we call home. It has islands and vast oceans just like Kerbin does. It's slightly smaller than Kerbin, but it does indeed have an atmosphere unlike the other moons of Jewel. Our craft gets into a polar orbit and then burns retrograde for just long enough to dip into the atmosphere and run our testing. The composition of Lade's atmosphere is simply amazing. Analysis suggests that Kerbals could breathe on its surface without assistance. I wonder if it already contains life. Interesting. After these tests, Pillager 3 pulls out of the atmosphere and gets into a stable polar orbit to study this interesting planet and to decide if it is a viable alternative to the planet we currently inhabit. The Pillager 3 has no more stops, and this final stop will conclude its mission. Back at home base, the conclusion of our testing has netted us 1,300 signs, enough to unlock four more tech nodes. Thank you for watching until the very end. I appreciate every single one of you. Sorry if your Kerbal wasn't chosen. Way more people commented than I was expecting. Let me know all the mistakes that I made down in the comments, and goodbye.